Hi everybody, it's Amanda. It's the 25th of April 2019 and uh, we are back today and going to be doing some channeling of Princess Diana. The second video of uh, her that I have done. Um, can't remember the exact date that I brought her through but it was a few months ago now and I think it's the most watched video on this channel so thank you very much it's well over 215,000 I think as of today and um, her presence has been a steady influence ever since I brought her through and she also in her wake um, introduced the rest of what I'm calling the heart squad which is a group of souls who are helping us beyond the veil and I've done a number of videos on that already and what I know will happen with this video is that we will obviously be talking to Diana but then she will also bring through um, some new people for us to be talking to as well and she describes herself as a shepherdess okay a shepherdess in that respect um, as though she is shepherding groups of people together um, both sides of the veil uh, as she did in life she was very much somebody who brought people together in life and in death and now in the afterlife as well so um, I am going to do this in a very uh, informal way I haven't got any particular questions that I'm really thinking I need to ask her. I've got some areas that I feel would be interesting. And the one thing that I do know she wants to talk about is life. Um, particularly today, uh, April the 25th, she is, she's got the most beautiful giddy, um, joyful light energy today and it's linked into an aspect of her soul and her being which was part of who she was but it's also to do with the imminent arrival of her grand son or granddaughter uh, linked to Harry and Meghan and in that light she is saying she doesn't want to be taken back into the Alma tunnel today and into that darkness and uh, that sadness. Uh, she knows that many people seem to tune into videos of her because they just want to hear about her death and she's saying she will talk about that but today she wants to talk about life and that's what we're going to do. We're going to celebrate life because there's a new life coming in um, linked to her energy. And she's just very excited and very joyful about it. So we're going to honour that. I would like to say at this juncture, before I formally bring her in, because her energy is here anyway, but before I formally introduce her, as it were, um, I would just like to say that as she is the mother of uh, both Harry and William, and their names are going to come up today, I know that, um, please be respectful in the comments because it's. I feel as though I'm inviting somebody in uh, to my space and onto my channel and I think it's very disrespectful to then have a load of hateful comments about that person's children and I know that other sites um, are getting a lot of uh, comments particularly linked into um, Megan and linked into Harry at the moment. There's also rumours about William and Kate. This is just not the site, this is not the channel, this is not the page where that's going to be um, welcomed. Okay, so please, if you're watching and wanting to say that type of stuff, just move on to another channel, okay? We're here to celebrate the life of this amazing woman, Princess Diana, ask her opinion on some subjects. She wants to talk about her sons today, but not in a gossipy way. She made that very clear in uh, the first video that I made. Um, she just wants to celebrate them actually more than anything else. So um, let's just do what I usually do, which is, um, let me show you her perfect photograph that I've chosen today. This is the photograph. Uh, well, that was the one from the video one, but I've actually chosen this image of her today. 
okay, as we um, uh, remember her like that. She was very glamorous, wasn't she? Um, so that's sitting here just to help me connect into her. In fact, I'm going to put that in my eye shot. Okay, I've got my roses dedicated to her. I've got my candle. Everything is set. Okay, so let's just spray the Rainbow Bridge spray, which just helps me to connect. Um, it links me into my guide, Archangel Metatron, who also creates a bridge linking both Earth, where we are now, and um, Spirit, other realms. So we're just creating that rainbow bridge as we do when we, we do this work. And we are inviting Diana just to come across and, um, and be with us. And um, it's, like she's, uh, it's like she's running across. She's showing me the image um, or the film of her when she used to, uh, it used to be sports day at uh, her ch children's school when they were young boys. And they used, they used to do um, parents races. And I think there are photographs of her where she's got bare feet and she's running really fast, trying to beat the other mums. And uh, it's not like she's in a race today, but it's like she's just got this very excitable, fast moving energy today. And it's like she really wants to be here and she really welcomes the opportunity to be with us, to actually share her excitement and her joy of, um, of, of the coming baby and, uh, and, and the celebration of life. So let's just welcome her. Um, she's saying, I'm too excited to sit on the bench. Um, Archangel Metatron always puts this bench, energetic bench, for people who are in spirit to come and sit with us to discuss. And everybody so far has sat on the bench, but she's like, I'm just, I'm too excited to sit down, Amanda. I'm too excited to sit down. She's saying, is it okay if I just stand behind the bench? And the bench is painted white and uh, I can see her behind the bench. Her hands are beautifully manicured. Her, I mean, I know, you know, in spirit, all of this doesn't really matter, but when they come to communicate with us, they like to present themselves in a certain way that we can relate to, that we can understand. Because, because obviously Diana as a body no longer exists. Um, she doesn't need to paint her nails or you know put her face on, but she's coming and she's, she's appearing very immaculately um, presented as she always did. Um, so I'm just seeing her very beautiful manicured hands um, on the back of this white bench. Just have a look at what she's wearing. Um, she's, she's dressed very simply, but very elegantly. Uh, the uh, way she was showing me that she was dressed earlier, so I can't quite see exactly the full outline of her at the moment um, in terms of what she's actually wearing. I can see her face, her hands and her body, but it's almost like her clothes are a little bit hidden. Um, again, she was presenting herself to me very much like the young kindergarten teacher that she was before she got married and before she had children. And um, so it's that type of attire. Uh, it's not sort of the regal wear that she used to wear as a princess. There's no tiara, there's no diamonds. Um, there is just uh, this simple, elegant outfit. I'm just going to close my window because my door is going crazy. Hold on. That's better. It's a shame to... Uh, it's a shame to shut the birds out, she says. Yes, I know. Okay. Okay, Diana, so let's just tune in and let's just feel into what she would like to talk about today. So, how are you doing, I want to say to her. How are you doing? How are you doing, Diana? I'm doing really well, she says. I'm doing really well. I'm very happy. I'm very happy with the way things are at the moment. Okay, um, I'm very happy in the way that I see, so I'm just get, putting her picture so I can see it and I can also look at you. <clears throat> I'm very happy with the way that my legacy and my energy is still being felt 
uh, upon your earth and I am so proud of my two boys, particularly today, particularly today. This is why I'm so happy to be here today because there is so much to be proud of today in them. Um, she's showing me, and uh, I've seen this already this afternoon, she's showing me the uh, she's showing me the photographs of William in New Zealand meeting Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister there. And I think he's there for the celebrations linked into Anzac Day, uh, or commemoration might be a better word, um, commemoration of Anzac Day. Uh, and also meeting some of the survivors of the terrorist attack there. And there's pictures of him sitting on a child's bed, as an example, and there's pictures of him giving the Maori um, greeting with the nose rub uh, to Jacinda as well. And um, I've seen those pictures myself in the paper, but what she is showing me, what Diana is showing me, is like an old-fashioned photograph album, um, and it's it's as though she's saying, She's, watch, she's watching from the other side of the veil, just as we maybe watch on TV or um, we look in a newspaper and we see these photographs. She's saying, I avidly um, watch what they are doing. And she's showing me, it's as though she's got like snapshots of, um, of, of William uh, right now in New Zealand. And it's like, it's an old fashioned photograph album. And it's like every time they do something that is um, that just makes her feel good or proud or happy. It's as though she is documenting it in, in this red leather bound photograph album. Uh, so there's photographs from today that she, of, you know, these are all energetic, but it's like, that's what she's showing me, um, images that are in this book. And then there's Harry also at Westminster today. Again, I, I guess it's another um, service linked into the Anzac Day celebration. So I keep saying celebrations. It's not celebrations, is it? Um, let me just ask, let me just see what the Anzac Day is linked into. I feel like I just need to honour that um, and get it right. So excuse me for one minute. I just want to see what that is all about. Anzac Day. Um, it says it's a national day of remembrance in Australia and New Zealand. Um, that commemorates all of the Australians and New Zealanders who served and who died in wars, conflicts and peacekeeping operations. It's observed on the 25th of April each year. Okay, so, um, so, so she's talking about the fact that both of her boys today are carrying on her legacy and her energy linked into humanitarian work and basically showing up, you know, showing up and um, demonstrating that they care about these issues. Um, she's showing me now the image of herself standing in the, um, the field where they were, uh, it was to do with uh, dismantling landmines. I believe that was only a few months, wasn't it, before she actually died. She's showing me that image and she's saying, I was, all, I was, I was very passionate about trying to get involved with uh, more peacekeeping efforts, um, but I didn't get the chance. So it's almost as though she's showing me this snapshot image of herself. We all know the image. She's standing in the field. She's got the Red Cross uh, white vest on, hasn't she? And it's to do, it was to do with um, talking about landmines and the need for them to be cleared in places where war had once been so that innocent people weren't injured by them. And she was saying, I was very passionate about that work and I, I really wanted to continue it. And if I had carried on and lived longer, that would have been an area of focus for me. She said, I would have ruffled quite a few feathers. And uh, some of the people's hands that I had shook um, would have sh would have shaken would have been shaken by some of the actions that I would have wanted to have done. So I'm getting the impression from her she's not telling me who they are. Um, I know that they're male, but I'm just seeing that she shook the hands of people in her life whose actions and whose energy linked into war and um, the supply of arms didn't always please her. In fact, it very much displeased her, she's saying. And 
what would have happened, what would have been, what would have been achieved would have been her becoming much more vocal in terms of speaking up um, with regard to an, an, anti-war basically, anti-war and some of those people who had been supporters would have struggled with that new stance that she would have taken. So she's saying, but my, 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 my boys will carry my work on. And she's saying, you haven't seen anything yet in terms of what they are to achieve in their life. Um, she comes through with a very strong, almost like, um, well, it is, it's like a lioness energy today relating to her sons and wanting to speak up for them and to defend them and she's saying I know full well um, the gossip and the rumours and the untruths and the lies and the misrepresentations and the gossip which the media likes to um, perpetuate. She said, I had it my whole life and I see it now being played out in my, my two sons. And she's saying, please, as with anything else, go into your own heart and feel for what is true and celebrate what is good about a person. Celebrate their light, celebra celebrate their goodness, celebrate the positive actions and the difference that they make in our world. Um, the world needs no more darkness. The world needs no more gossip. The world needs to turn away from the machine that perpetuates the energy of needing to know every last detail of somebody's life as though it were their own. Um, she had already been talking to me very strongly about the fact that as a collective we need to let go of the image that we have of Harry and William walking behind her coffin and she's saying it's as though that was such a powerful image she's all about what we see today it's very much about what we see with our eyes and images that we see She's saying the power of that image of her two sons walking behind her coffin has almost been set in, um, has been preserved somehow in the psyche. It's as though it's, um, it's seared into our consciousness. And what it's done is it's prevented us from being able to allow her sons to grow into the mature men that they now are. It's as though when we look at her sons, we still see them as those little boys. We don't see them as the grown men that they are now. And she's saying, I as a mother have had to move on, as all mothers have to move on, um, in terms of stages that their children go through, and realise that they don't stay that way. Um, for very long. And what she means by stay that way, she's talking about the stages of child's develop of a child's development. And if you are a parent, you, you know exactly what she means by that. It's as though we, um, we, we, we all do this. It's as though sometimes we, we keep people at a certain age um, for all sorts of reasons. And she's saying that, please could we release uh, William and Harry from that energetic grip that we all still have on them, whereby they are still the little boys who lost her and who are walking behind the coffin. She's saying, although of course that happened, um, time has passed and now she wants us to be able to acknowledge them as the men that they are and what they need to grow into. And it's as though they are being stifled by a collective energy that wants to keep them as little boys for some reason. She's saying, I've managed to acknowledge them as grown men. Um, 
please try to do the same. Okay, so it's almost like a cry for her in that way. Um, let's just ask her a little bit then about each of them, uh, what she's willing to share anyway. So let me just go into that. So let's ask Diana firstly about uh, William. Okay, let's ask about William. She's saying I try and make him laugh. Um, she's just showing me this very stern face that he can have from time to time. Um, very serious. He can be very serious. And he, she's saying that the weight of expectation uh, and duty and responsibility on his shoulders is very heavy. And she says that that will lighten for him when he fully steps into his destiny and, he, and his role. And he, and he realizes that actually, um, it's almost like it's not as bad as he thinks it's going to be. <laughs> there's, this, there's just this real sense of, um, it's a heaviness on his shoulders. It weighs heavily on him, um, but it feels as though it's also because he wants to do it right. She's saying it's because he wants to do it right. He wants to do it the right way. He wants to um, he wants to get it right, basically. It's almost like a bit of a perfectionist type streak in him in that respect. Um, and she's saying he needs to just lighten up a bit, okay? Uh, take a note from his brother, she's saying. <laughs> and we know anyway, don't we, that they are very much like chalk and cheese, William and Harry. They're very different personalities very different energies and she's she's actually saying to me it's almost like as a, a mother's advice would be that Harry needs a bit more of William's um, stoicness um, and steadiness and uh, William needs a bit more of Harry's light-heartedness she's saying um, it's as though they've gone to they've gone to different extremes uh, and there needs to be a bridging of them both in the middle okay um, let's just have a look at how she's feeling about Harry. She, she's saying she's saying it with great love, but she's she's sort of saying that with Harry, uh, it was he he always made her. It's just like she's showing me tearing her hair out a little bit, um, not in a horrible way, but it's just he he, he keeps her on her toes is what she's saying. He keeps me on my toes. Uh, he always did. So as a toddler, he would be the one who would be, I don't know, running around all over the place and getting into mischief and, um, you know, finding him in weird and wonderful places. Um, it's almost like, what's Harry doing now? That's sort of like an energy that was around him as a little boy and it's still a bit around him now as an adult. So uh, she's saying, she's saying, but he's, he's, he's good, he's good. Um, she's saying, I, I keep, I keep an eye on him. I keep an eye on him. Um, she wants to talk about the divine masculine and the divine feminine energies. And I do know, cause she's already said this to me that she has expressed the fact that her two sons, William and Harry represent two different aspects of the divine masculine energy. And she's saying that that doesn't mean that they're perfect and that they are 100% what it's meant to be. It's the fact that all men have the, have, a, uh, a, have the divine masculine energy within them. And it's just that it's very clear to her that both of her two boys have got different aspects of the divine masculine energy. And she's saying what's interesting as well is that they've chosen wives who also have got very different aspects of the divine feminine energy. Again, not perfect. They're not meant to be perfect. Nobody is perfect. But they, but both Megan and Kate represent almost like two different archetypes, if you were, um, of what it is to be female, um, what femininity looks like, how femininity is expressed. And she's showing me um, Megan in terms of being a good match for Harry, in that Harry has got a sort of bit of a wild streak in him, and, and as has Megan. Uh, and she's saying they fit well in that respect, although sparks fly as well, she's saying, but shh, I shouldn't say that. 
<laughs> it's like she, don't 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 press me on that amanda she's saying <laughs> but she's joke she's jokingly saying it's like sh i shouldn't have said that um whereas with kate kate is sort of just this very sort of um she just she's just showing me that they're very beautifully matched both wives are very beautifully matched to the husbands that they've got so again you know kate as we know kate is has got this quite dignified calm um again quite stoic manner about her um she's showing me both couples being perfect in the way that they are but completely and utterly different um am i allowed to ask about any rumors of rift between them diana there are rumors of rift between the two your two boys she's saying oh yes she's saying yes sometimes i just need to wish i could bang their heads together but she's saying doesn't every mother think that of their of their children from time to time she's saying they'll be okay though she says they love each other and they will be okay it's nothing to fret about nothing to worry about too much she says the media like to stir up more than is actually there it's all um it's all retrievable not that it needs retrieving to any great extent anyway um she's saying i'm not overly concerned about any of that anything else you want to say on your sons she's saying she likes the way that um william uh gets down on the floor and plays with his kids uh she's saying some, that's something that his father wasn't ever very good at She's not saying that in a dig. It's more just that it feels as though William's very good at actually getting on the floor and playing with them, um, getting down to their level, being able to actually uh, get into uh, the energy of uh, what it is to be a child again and to play in a way that his children can relate to. It's as though all of the stuffiness and stiff upper lip nurse of Charles has sort of um, has dissolved in this generation so she really likes that and she's saying she, <laughs> she's laughing and saying Harry will probably be an even bigger kid than his own kid <laughs> but again it's it's said um, it's said with love and with humor um, she's just got a, she's just got a lovely sense of humor today um, what else then in terms of your two boys Diana She's saying other people around them um, are causing some of the um, difficulties at this time. She's not talking about the two wives. She's talking about, um, it's like faceless people, courtiers, I suppose, um, people within the different courts. It's as though there are other people that seem to um, interfere. It's almost like a Chinese whisper type situation. Um, she's saying if i was still alive i would get all of them around a kitchen table and we'd have a good meal and we'd um and we'd thrash it all out you know it's but there's other people who interfere and uh, there are other energies that interfere between the two, the dynamic of the two brothers at the moment um okay uh so anything to say with regard to megan there is something to say with regard to megan and she's already been talking to me about this it's quite interesting because um, she was talking a little bit about the men, the type of men that she used to love and why she used to love um, a particular type of man. And this isn't anything to do with Charles, by the way, it's after Charles. And she was mentioning um, Oliver Hoare, uh, Dodi Fayed and Hasnad Khan. Um, I don't know about Oliver Hoare's... Um, racial makeup but i do know obviously with hasnet khan he came from pakistan i believe and dodi fayed um uh, certainly a muslim and it's as though she deliberately chose and was attracted to um men who were the complete and utter opposite of what she describes as the old etonian um stiff upper lipness that you have to be British to fully understand, okay? The, the, um, the type of man and men that she had grown up around and indeed had married in Charles, who are all of a certain ilk. And it feels as though 
um, after the divorce, she felt so badly burnt by that whole energetic um, group of beings that she wanted to move as far away as possible from them. And she's saying it wasn't a conscious choice, but now looking back on it, she can see um, that it was, a, it, was, it was subconscious. It was like a subconscious drive to seek out um, partners who were very different from her in terms of upbringing, in terms of country of origin, and in terms of belief and faith. And she's saying, I can see the same with regard to Harry. She's saying, Harry is like a chip off the old block. And again, it's as though she's showing me that if Harry had been presented with 20 beautiful, um, she's being naughty here, but I must, must say what she's saying. 20 beautiful Vestal Virgins is what she's saying. <laughs> but you know, like debutantes, you know, it's like a debutantes, all, all very um, beautifully made up and manicured and from the best families in, in England, you know, the, the, the aristocratic lineage and all of that. She's saying he would have just, he'd have just been bored stiff, you know? He needed to find a partner like she did after she divorced Charles, who was from a completely different culture, um, racial heritage and belief system from his own. She says he shares that with me. She says, I completely and utterly understand why he chose somebody who was from a different country and, um, and a different heritage and had grown up in a different way. Um, she's saying, I, I completely get that. It's like, that's my boy type energy. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting because I've never really thought about that in relation to Diana's later choices. Um, but she showed me, she's showing me very clearly that Harry gets that, um, impulse and that, um, desire from her and, it's to do with obviously being attracted to Megan. Megan's a very beautiful woman, but it's also to do with not wanting, um, it's almost like not wanting what is offered at home. I mean, I know he, he did, he has had relationships obviously with um, debutantes and uh, is debutante even a word that people use anymore? I don't know whether it is, but you know, um, girls from English aristocracy. Um, what was the lady called? Crisida. Crisida, somebody or other, I can't remember what her name was, but anyway, the, the, there have been some. But again, the, the lady that he was with before Meghan, she also came from South Africa. She was very different sort of energy. Um, again, different upbringing um, from money, but again, just different. So she's saying, he gets that from me. You know, that's something I can completely relate to. And she's saying that they are in uncharted waters there in terms of trying to bridge two different cultural um, energies. And she's saying, I will try my best to help them and to steer them because she's saying where they, where they are at now is where I never actually got to. Uh, I may very well have had other relationships with men who were not necessarily from my immediate social group in terms of what was expected of me. Um, but I never had a child with them. You know, Harry and Meghan are about to have a child. It's like entering a whole other territory and area. So she's saying, I'm, I'm really going to try to, to help them. She said, whether they listen or not, I have no idea, but I'm going to try to help them. Um, so I, th I thought that was really interesting with regard to her. Uh, anything else to say with regard, regard to... There's a limit to how far she wants to go with it because she doesn't want to get into gossip. So let's just turn attention to the new baby for a moment. So the new baby landing soon, she's saying. She's saying my arms are getting um, heavy from cradling this baby, um, which is quite a nice image, isn't it? Uh, she sh she's saying my arms, are... you know how when you've got a young, a little baby and you do that to soothe that? She said, my arms are getting really quite sore, you know, it's like I need to, I need to allow this, this child energetically to, 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 to go to where it's meant to go. Okay. Which is obviously to them. Um, and that's, that's a lovely, that's a lovely image she's just given us. Um, 
I, I, I've never, yeah, I just think it's beautiful what, what she's just shown me there. It's like she's been soothing this child. Um, she's also says that she's been, um, she's been soothing the child, but it's as though she's been, she's energetically been communicating with this soul that's going to come in for Harry and Meghan in terms of preparing the soul as best as she can for what is to come. Because whatever child comes through and is born, whether it's a boy, whether it's a girl, it isn't going to be a normal life that this child has in the same way that William and uh, Kate's children are never going to have normal lives. No member of the royal family ever really has a normal life. So it's as though she's tried to prepare this soul energetically um, for as an, as easy a landing as possible, she's saying. But she's saying it's still going to be a bit bumpy. I don't know what she means by that. Might mean absolutely nothing. Um, it's just literally like it landed, the soul landing, you know, physically being on, on Earth. I will say that it's quite interesting. Before I started this video, I went to pick up one of my spray bottles. I think, I think it's just fallen on the floor. Um, it's emerald. Let me just get it. Um, emerald. And the reason why I want to talk about Emerald is that in this spray uh, is an, an essential oil called Vetiver. Vetiver. And Vetiver is an oil that is very grounding. And I, I just wonder whether there's something going on here, which is to do with the Vetiver oil helping to just ground this soul that's about to arrive. Um, and oh, she's saying also, she's not going to tell us the sex of it. She's saying it's not a game. You know, these are people's lives and they need respecting. Um, but she's saying, you know, whether she knows, but whether it's divine feminine or divine masculine that's coming in via this child's energy, that is being grounded with this vetiver oil. So I just feel like I need to spray the oil. emerald for some reason. Emerald, she's shown me the emerald as an actual stone as well. The emerald, the emerald... Something about emeralds. Did Meghan wear emeralds when she was uh, when she got married? I think there might have been something about emeralds and Meghan. I can't remember the story, but I'm just feeling there's a link to emeralds somehow. So I don't know. Not quite sure what that's all about. Let's move on. Um, let's just see what else Diana wants to talk about today. I'm going to ask her about fame and. Uh, the price of fame, okay, the price of fame. So Diana, you were probably the world's most famous woman when you were alive. You were relentlessly pursued and photographed and harassed. What can you tell me about that? Felt like a fly being caught in a trap. F felt like I was hunted. Felt like I was hunted. Okay. Let's just see what she wants to say on this whole thing about the price of fame. The price of fame. The price of being that famous. She, she's laughing and saying, well, somebody has to put their hand up and do it. <laughs> But in a way, there's a seriousness to that. Somebody has to put their hand up and be that person that is the most famous person on the planet, you know, or one of the most famous people on the planet to not just allow that soul to have that experience, but to allow the other people uh, to have the experience. And what she means by that is to allow the collective the experience of what it is to put somebody on a pedestal and hero worship them, um, which was never something that I was actually comfortable with, she says, by the way. It wasn't something that I ever particularly asked for, but it is something that I became. People put me onto a pedestal. People still do put me onto a pedestal. I never wanted to be on the pedestal. Um, and it's this thing about why she's asked, it's almost like she's throwing the question back at us. She's saying, why, why do we need to do that? Why do you need to do that? Why do you need to have somebody that's up there? You know, 
um, and she's saying that that whole en that whole energy of want needing somebody to be up there that we really look up to and aspire to and is almost otherworldly, you know? It's like they're almost not human. And she's saying, it's, of course, it's not just me in that club. There are many others in that club, including many others of the Heart Squad that work with her, by the way. She's saying, um, why we need to heal that. She's saying unity consciousness can't come in whilst we still put people up on pedestals the whole time. She's saying there's a there's a big difference between respecting somebody and admiring somebody and being interested in their life and their work and or over because she's almost like it's become versus becoming almost like a praying ma praying mantis is what she's saying. It's like becoming a praying mantis and believing that everything that is in that person's life or anything linked to somebody belongs to them, you know? Um, she said, where, where did all that come, come in from? And she's saying, of course, I, as a member of the royal family, was pushed up onto the pedestal almost as high as you can go. Um, so she's saying, yes, it was a lesson for me, but it was also a lesson for you in terms of why have you chosen to do that to somebody? Would you still do that to somebody today? Um, the answer at the moment is probably yes, but she's asking us just to question why we do that, why we do that. saying respect and reverence for somebody doesn't have to always be displayed outwardly. Um, there is a quiet dignity in terms of admiring somebody from afar and holding them in high esteem without She's making a joke. She's saying, without acting like I might have done whilst watching a pop concert. She's showing me Live Aid. Okay, I know she went to Live Aid and she enjoyed Live Aid. And she said, I shouted my head off, you know, and I screamed and I was in awe of some of the stars that I met. They were in awe of me, but I was in awe of them. And she's saying, looking back on it now, what's so interesting? It's like she's sitting down there having a cup of tea with us. I can see like a, a china cup and saucer. It's English tea. She's just like sitting down on the bench now. And she's saying, what's so interesting now, Amanda, is she says, when you come to spirit, you realise everybody's equal and you can walk down the road and nobody really bats an eyelid in terms of so-and-so's just walked past. Um, she's saying it's very much an earthly thing that you have to put people up on pedestals. Um, and she's saying, really, that needs that whole energy needs to fall away. But for it to fall away, you need to question why you need it in the first place. And why you tend to need it is because it's filling a lack that is within you, that somehow you are not good enough. And she's saying you are always good enough. You have everything that is beautiful and, and admirable within yourself. She's saying respect people, but don't let it get out of balance. Um, and she's now just showing me the, you know, the paparazzi and the way that they, um, they hounded her in life. Um, and I am going to now just go, I know I said I wasn't going to at the start, but she's taking me there. So I'm going to be led by her. It's like she's showing me those last moments where she was hounded into the tunnel in Paris. Um, and what would you like to share with us then today, Diana? She's saying it is fine to talk about it actually in the same video, Amanda, because she says, I know that you work with light and dark and you work with both energies and it's important to honour both. So even though I am here and I'm giddy with excitement over the birth of my grandchild and I'm feeling so happy and joyous, there is also this other energy, which is to do with the fact that I am not there physically on the earth plane to hold my child hold my grandchild and of course that is caused by what happened in Paris in 1997 was it something like that 20 odd years ago so she's just taking me back and I actually before we get completely to the tunnel I want to go back to the last summer Diana the last summer that you had 
the last holiday that you had with Dodie, where you were on the yachts, you were in swimsuits, you were being photographed around, you know, various places. And what was what was going on with all of that? How were you feeling that last summer? And by the last summer, I'm really talking about the last holiday, okay? Um, we know that she had left her sons or her sons were in Balmoral, I believe, in Scotland. And she went off, I believe, to the south of France, Mediterranean anyway. She's photographed on the yacht. There's that iconic image of her sitting on the yacht, you know, staring out to sea with her legs dangling down. Uh, so that's where we're going back to. OK, that's where I want to, want to ask her about. So let's just go back there to those times. Um, she's saying, do you know, the, the moments that I felt most free on that holiday was when I was in the sea. She says, hey, I'm a Cancerian. Um, she says, I loved I loved the water. And she's showing me herself in the sea. And she's and she's saying, I felt so free when I was either in the sea or on the sea. Um, she said, I would have been quite suited to have married somebody with a big yacht like that. That doesn't mean that it necessarily would have been Dodie, by the way. Um, but she's just showing me, um, she's showing me boats and yachts and, um, and the Mediterranean Sea and swimming and just the whole energy of water being um, very cathartic for her. She's saying, looking back now, she sees, she sees that the water that she was in played a role in terms of preparing her for what was to come. It was almost like a cleansing process. She was cleansed both by the elements of air and the sun and the sea, the salt water of the sea. It's as though her body was purified. She was going, she didn't realise it at the time, but it feels as though there was like a purification and cleansing process from those last few days or weeks where she was in, in and around the Mediterranean in that water. And she's, she's saying it was a beautiful time. It was a time of um, carefree abandon, abandon, abandonment. You know, she felt very carefree. Um, although she said, I didn't, of course, when I was pursued. But when she was in the sea, on the yacht, that all feels quite good. Um, what else would you like to share with us about that last summer? She said, oh, it was decadent. Um, she's having a bit of a naughty giggle. She's saying it was a bit decadent, Amanda. Um, she's saying it couldn't have lasted like that forever. Uh, she's, she was saying, but it was quite nice to dip into for a few weeks. And by that, she's showing me, um, she's showing me the yacht and just fi fineries, for want of a better word. You know, she's showing me jewels um, and it's like all the nice trappings of, of, of being rich, I suppose, you know, and she was saying it was very nice to dip into that. I know her whole life she'd been rich, but it felt as though that last summer was, there was an energy of decadence to it as well. Um, really going over and above, you know, the top restaurants, uh, the best places, um, just everything being the creme de the creme de the creme. Everything was like laid out on a table for me, she said. I was spoiled like a princess. And she's saying, yes, I realise what I've just said. I was a princess, but it was like I was really, oh, she's saying it was like I was actually treated like a princess for the first time in my life. Um, and she's saying this is more to do with Dodie's energy. Um, she's saying what was so interesting when I was married to Charles was that I never felt really like a princess. Um, she's showing me Balmoral and um, she's showing me the fact that it was um, the rooms in Balmoral where she must have slept. Um, she's saying very nice, but quite Spartan, um, you know, not, not how you imagine a fairy tale castle. Let's put it that way. Um, she says, I mean, no disrespect from that. And there's nothing wrong with, um, being frugal. This is all relative, of course, because of course Balmoral Castle is still a blinking castle. I understand that, but she's just trying to make the point that her life with Charles, um, it didn't feel like a, well, it wasn't, was it? It wasn't a happy ever after fairy tale princess ride. And it, she's saying it was never that from, from the, almost the first moment. She's saying even walking down the aisle in that beautiful dress, she's saying, part of me, I never felt like a princess. She's saying, I know I look like a princess and everybody wanted me to be the princess and I was the princess, but inside of myself, I never felt like the princess. 
She said that final holiday with Dodie, I felt like a princess. Somebody was treating me as though I was one. And she said, I, I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. Um, there's almost this energy with her, which is almost like slightly embarrassed in terms of, um, was it was it a bit, was it a bit naughty or a bit shallow almost to have enjoyed it to the extent that I did? But she said, but I did. Um, but it, there's this feeling with her that she knows that it wouldn't have, it, it couldn't have carried on like that. Um, she would have got back to her duty. Tell me what you mean by that, Diana, duty. Oh, my nose is itching again. It keeps happening when I'm tuning into spirit. Sorry, guys. It doesn't look very pretty me doing this, but oh, I can't help it. Um, Tell me what you mean by getting back to duty, Diana. What, what I mentioned at the start, she's saying, um, wanting to work more in terms of being a peacekeeper. And um, she's saying, my work would have changed. My work would have changed. She said, if you look back on my life, my work always changed. There were certain charities that I were very dear to me and would always have been with me and I would always, always have supported. But it, it feels like she wanted to get more political. I mean, she could never obviously become a political leader, but it, it's just, that's the energy that she's taking me into. It's a more political energy. Some of the things that she wanted to start speaking up on, places she wishes to go, people that she wishes to meet would have raised a lot of eyebrows, she's saying. It would have raised a lot of eyebrows. People would not have been happy. But she's saying that was what I would have wanted to have got into. And she's and that's why she's so proud of her boys, because it feels like that's what they're going to do. But she keeps saying you haven't seen anything yet. OK, it's like they haven't really even started. She says, you just wait. You just wait. You'll, you'll be surprised. So go back to that last summer again. Sorry. So you felt like a princess. Um, but she says there's no such thing as happy ever after. Um, by that, she's not wanting to crush people's dreams. She's talking about once upon a time, you know, the whole once upon a time, Disneyland. She's, you know, at the end of the day, um, the land of make-believe is make-believe. It's almost as though... I lived my whole life based around what other people wanted to believe it to be. Um, and I came crashing down to earth with a bump. Okay, so do you want to say anything about Dodie? I must admit, I'm struggling to connect to Dodie. I'm just going to say that at the outset. I've tried already and didn't get a good feel. Not, not a good feeling. I just mean I couldn't feel him strongly. I will just try again, but I'm not going to promise anything. Let's just see if Dodie wants to... Or if she she says anything, I don't know. Let's just ask about Dodie. <sighs> Interesting. She's saying to me, better left unsaid. I don't quite know what that means, to be honest. It might be something to come back to in another video. I'm not going to push it. She's saying he treated me very well that last summer, though. That's what she's wanting us to focus on, that she was treated very well. He say, she's saying he treated me like a lady um, and he was fun and he made me feel alive again and he made me feel loved. I just don't get the feeling that it would have lasted is what the impression I'm getting from her. She's not saying that. It's just the impression I get... Um, She's not wanting to go too much further with regard to him. Um, in terms of whether he's with her in spirit, I, I'm, I'm not sensing that. I have to be honest, I'm not really sensing that. Um, I think it's a soul group thing. I just feel as though whatever the soul group is that she comes from is different from where he comes from. And it's like they could meet if they wanted to. Um, but I don't feel it's like they're like buddy buddies in spirit and walking around hand in hand or anything like that. I just don't feel, uh, I don't feel a strong, I don't feel anything, to be honest, with regard to his energy around her. She's saying she's sorry that he got dragged into the mess. She's sorry that he got dragged into the mess. And it was a mess. The way that it ended, it was a mess. 
so much left unsaid, so many broken hearts. Dodie. I, I'm wanting to say it's like he didn't know what he was getting himself into. Almost feeling like a sense of guilt from her. Um, that's far too heavy a word, okay, guilt. But it's the only earthly word I can use to describe what I'm feeling around her now, which is something along the lines of that I got him involved in something that ultimately, of course, led to his death. Whereas all he actually did was try to make me feel good those last few weeks and that last summer. Um... She's saying we were both quite lost in different ways. Um, I get an impression of Dodie in front of me and um, he's not looking like a rich playboy. He's looking like he's like he's like he's got his hands in his pockets. Um, he's just sort of like looking down. Um, and there's this feeling they were both a bit lost. And I think that was part of the attraction and pull towards each other as well. Sometimes when two people come together who both feel lost, they feel as though they can make it right. Um, but of course, what we know spiritually is that you can't do that. You can only create a, a good relationship when you both are feeling quite whole and happy. Um, it feels as though both of them were trying to literally fill some form of void that they had within themselves at that time. So it feels as though the summer was very extravagant and trying to run away from something uh, to a degree, trying to run away from something. Okay, so we'll see how far we can go with this tonight. It's tonight here as I'm making this. Uh, I'm just going to ask her now about those final hours. And we all know what the final hours were. It's been reported over and over and over and over. So the visit to the Ritz, the attempts to outrun the paparazzi. She said, I was really feeling like a hunted animal. She's, she's saying everything had got out of control at that point. Everything was out of control. Like a, a speeding train that you can see coming towards you, but you can't get out of the way of how she's describing it. She's saying I didn't know who I could trust at that time. It was reported that they ate in a restaurant at the Ritz and um, I believe that lots of people were looking at them. So they retired to their private suite to finish the meal. And what she's saying to me now is that I couldn't, I couldn't eat anything. You know that feeling when you're feeling quite anxious and stressed and you don't want to eat. It's almost like the sight of food just makes you like, oh, no, I, I can't. I don't want it. That's the energy that I'm feeling with her. It's like I, I didn't want to eat anything. I couldn't eat anything. It's like I'm just seeing her pushing her food away. Um... And of course, she did have an eating disorder, didn't she, in earlier life. So the fact that she's bringing up the fact that she felt like she wanted to push the food away, it wasn't the fact that it was a return to bulimia or anything like that. It was more its more just she's trying to show me that she felt in an emotional turmoil on that particular night. she she It wasn't a happy-go-lucky energy. It was there was, some, there was something wrong. Um, it's my dog. Hold on. I'll pause the camera. Hold on. Hi, me again. Sorry, my dog does that every time an important piece of information comes through. Those people that watch my videos know it happens all the time. I was just saying she felt there was something wrong. She was a very sensitive, empathic woman. 
and um, so I'm just moving this because the light is changing in my room. Uh, she was a very sensitive, empathic woman and she knew, she knew that something was wrong, okay? She couldn't put her finger on exactly what was wrong but it was just like this escalating sense of tension, crisis um, and feeling trapped like an animal, okay? So getting into the car, um, she said I had no awareness at that moment that everything was about to be snuffed out though. I didn't know it was going to be that moment. Uh, I'm going to ask her about her transition. Okay, so... Because she's saying there isn't a lot for me to say that you don't already know before we go into the tunnel. She's saying because my whole life was lived on camera. She's saying you've seen all the photographs, okay? You've seen all the film. Um, you've seen all the shots of me looking behind and Dodie and all the rest of it. We've all seen it. She's saying what you haven't seen is when we went into the tunnel. Okay, so um, let's just have a look at what she wants to bring through and share with us. I'm feeling it was completely and utterly instant, um, which I guess is what happens in a car crash. It's just sort of like slamming like that into the wall, cement, you know, uh, no preparation whatsoever no um no awareness that it was about to happen it was like one minute well not minute second fine next minute wham um the lights went out she says the lights went out um that's interesting she's saying to me the lights went out immediately now i know because it's been reported that she supposedly said some words she came to, she came to, she was semi-conscious, she was alive, she was, she communicated to, uh, for a degree, um, after the crash, when, when the medics got to her. But what she's saying to me is it's almost like, oh, this is a horrible analogy, but it's the only analogy I can give you that's going to make any sense whatsoever. When a, when a chicken, okay, when a chicken is killed and its head, get, its head gets chopped off, I know her head wasn't chopped off, just allow me the analogy. When it gets killed in that way, supposedly the, the chicken can still walk, run around. You know, it's like it's, it's basically dead, but it's still operating. There's something that takes over, whether it's in the, I don't know, I'm not a medical person, something within the... Um, uh, neurological state of the body that looks like it's still alive but it's not alive and that's what she's showing me it's like it everything went the the moment that she that the tunnel they hit the tunnel the lights went off it was over she's saying she doesn't remember saying the words that she said she doesn't remember any part of being semi-conscious or awake she remembers none of it um so to her, it's quite almost like macabrely interesting when she looks down upon us in terms of what other people are saying happened in terms of the state that she was in. Um, I'm just getting this, in, this feeling from her that it was literally one moment it was light and the next moment the lights went out and it was over. Um, she's saying I didn't suffer in any way. I didn't suffer in any way. She said, I was shocked though, I was shocked. I couldn't quite believe they had done it. There, I've said it. I couldn't quite believe they'd done it. I couldn't quite believe it had happened. I couldn't quite believe it had really happened. That they'd done it. I had been saying for years and nobody listened to me. Everybody thought I was mad. I knew myself and my destiny better than anybody. I'm sorry that other people were affected by it. I'm sorry that other people died in it. She's still going on about Dodie. There's a feeling that she pulled other people into it that she didn't mean to pull into it. Of course, it wasn't her fault, but there's, there's still an energy there. There's something that still needs to be healed there with regards to that. 
She's saying get some cards out, Amanda. Okay, I'm gonna get some cards out at this point. Let me um, move my camera back a little bit. Put the flowers back into shot. Put her back into shot. And I'm gonna ask about her death, okay? I'm gonna ask about her death. <clears throat> and tell me what you want to say through the cards, Diana. Just do it this way so you can actually see what I'm doing. Sorry, I haven't got any fancy setup here, so you'll have to bear with me. Just uh, <laughs> this is the best that I can do. Right, there's a card just fallen out there. It's the, the death card, okay? So that's Diana saying yes, okay? I want you to use these cards to tell tell them something. Um, let's just have a look at the card. We all know the death card on the tarot, but there it is. Okay, the death card. I'm drawn to say about this card, and I've never said it before, but it strikes me that the horse is white, um, a symbol of purity, a symbol of innocence, a symbol of light. The horse almost feels like it's Diana, you know, who had this beautiful energy of lightness and love about her and um, the grim reaper is riding the white horse to her death that's what it is death okay um, what do you want what else do you want to say about this Diana um, let's have another few cards let's have um, that one okay the four of swords okay um what i want to say about that is if you've been to any stately homes or castles um i'm i'm being shown windsor castle but um diana isn't built Di diana is not built Di sorry diana is not buried in windsor castle She's buried um, on her family estate on an island. But this almost feels like some mausoleum that you would find in a castle. It shows somebody there who is, um, it's like a, it's like a, to me that looks like almost like a burial type chamber. Can you see? With like a stone statue on it. And this is the young woman who's visiting the person in the, in, in the, in the coffin, the mausoleum. Okay. So she's showing us that. I do sense that the young girl there is i don't feel it's her i feel like diana's showing herself there dead basically and there's this young there's this younger energy visiting her this feels like it's somebody in the future who carries on her energy and it's female it's not her sons the two of cups Okay, that's her and Dodie. It was it was a relationship where they did love each other. Whether it was going to endure or not, no idea. She has no idea either. They never got the chance. But it was a relationship where there was love. There was genuine affection. It wasn't just fun and frivolity. Show me the energy around your death, please. Show us the energy around your death. So another couple of cards. Show us the energy around your death, Diana. The Eight of Swords, a woman being cut free from something that binds her. Judgment on the bottom of the deck, I'm gonna take that one. How many cards have I got? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, let's have seven because Diana's birthday was in July, I believe. I'm just being told seven anyway, so let's have seven cards. So two more cards. Show me the energy around her death. The Magician. And one more. Show me the energy around her death. Show me the energy around her death. Queen of Swords and the Queen of Wands on the bottom of the pack. That's eight cards, I know, but we've got two queens here, okay? Two queens. It 
was never going to be allowed that there would be two queens. I don't feel this is Queen Elizabeth. I actually feel this is linked into Charles and Diana and Camilla. There could never be two queens in England. I'm choosing my words carefully. Um, one of them is the Queen of Swords, the other one is the Queen of Wands. England could not have two queens. So one had to be freed. One had to be cut loose. One had to face that fate. I need, a, I need a card to uh, understand why we've got the Magician, because you could read that in many different ways. Why have we got the Magician card there? Why is the Magician card linked to Diana's death? The Five of Swords, yeah, okay. Somebody used powers, all of the powers that they had. The Magician is somebody that has all of the powers, everything to their disposal. Um, and, and, and they used it to win a victory. But at what cost is the victory? Okay. Somebody is victorious, but yet there has been an awful lot of damage done by winning the battle. Okay. Somebody called, there was a judgment call with regard to Diana's life. Tell me more about the Four of Swords, this energy here. I'd like to know a little bit more about that, please. Why has that card come out? The Empress. I'm getting the same message, that there can only be one Queen. Because here, look, the Queen, the Empress is the Queen. Um, in England, swans all belong to the sovereign. Okay, they're all meant, they're all said to belong to the sovereign. Um, there is an energy here linked into a competition between women. Okay, two queens. And here we've got, I want to say like a dead queen. And here we've got the queen that's still alive. I want to bring in an American influence here. That looks to me a bit like Statue of Liberty type energy. And why I'm bringing that in is I'm not saying somebody in America was responsible. I'm just feeling an American influence. Was there a person responsible for Diana's death? Was there a person or energy responsible for Diana's death? Was there a person or energy responsible for Diana's death? Was there a person or energy responsible for Diana's death? The King of Cups, okay? And on the bottom of the pack, we've got the Ten of Swords. I'm gonna let you make your own conclusions from that. Don't wanna to say too much more on that, okay? I think it's pretty clear what that means. Wow, okay. Goodness, well what, what do we do with that then, Diana? Um, take me into the future, will the truth come out? Will the truth come out? I'm a bit stunned by this. Will the truth come out? The Ace of Pentacles, which is usually to do with a fresh start. Let's just go back to ask Diana a little bit more. Okay, you asked me to pull the cards. I've pulled the cards. 
What is there to say after we've seen what they say? The cards don't lie, is what she's saying. But it's okay. I'm at peace with it. It was part of a destined plan. It was always going to end that way. It was meant to end that way. It was also meant to shape my boys. It's like she wants to come back to talk about her sons. It was meant to shape my sons. Um, to give them something which they really had to dig deep into. Emotional pain that creates growth, empathy, sensitivity, compassion. And I'm always around them and I always will be. Hi, um, I had to take a break actually, just because um, I paused it because I thought, do I even want to put this video out uh, with what that's just said in those cards? Um, this is what I'm going to say. My battery is also about to die. I am going to probably upload the video. Um, <clears throat> whoever was, was responsible for her death, I feel it wasn't just one individual. I know we had the King of Cups come out, but I've just had another look at the death card. I just paused and had a little you know, moment to myself. And I've never noticed before on the death card, can you see that there is that, sorry, I haven't got my glasses on, that figure there, can you see that figure there lying on the ground? That almost looks like somebody linked into religion. Um, can, you, can you see what I'm referring to? I hope the card is showing it properly. It almost looks like um, a priest or it, it links me to religion. So it's, and it's on the death card. So there's, a, there's an energy linked into nobility, um, elite, religion. Religion comes into this somehow. And I'm just going to think I'm going to put the video up and I'm going to see what the comments are like and what what people what people want to say about it. OK, and then I might go back in another time um, and ask again. Uh, I don't feel I've got it within me today right now to do um, to do much more on this because I'm feeling headachey. OK, which just says to me I've had enough energy on this today. It's quite a dark, old, deep subject. And I didn't actually think we were going to get into it on this video, um, but she has brought it up. So I'm going to respect what it is that she wanted to talk about today. Um, she's wanting to leave on a positive note. She's saying death is never the end. And that's why she wanted us to focus on new life at the start of this video and the birth of her grandchild. And um, it just feels as though it's the next generation that are going to right a lot of the wrongs. And her boys feel as though they play a pivotal role in that. Um, she says they are untainted and they are pure and they carry my seed, uh, they carry my light and they, help, they will help to redress and correct and heal what needs to be healed. And she's saying my voice will be heard through them. Um, until you're sick of hearing it. <laughs> okay, so let's just thank her for today's insights then. And um, just uh, allow her to go back to her other side, other side of the veil. And she's just going back. She's barefoot for some reason. She's showing me herself barefoot. And she is dressed just like that young kindergarten teacher with, with the long skirt, very simple top, long, slightly longer hair. Um, and she feels as though she's got a weight off her chest, um, probably in relation to what she's just said about the death. But there is more to say. I know there's more to say. So um, we will come back to it another time. But for today, I feel that that's a good place to leave it. Um, let's just see if there's any parting shot from her as she walks away from us. Um, She's saying, no, it's like it's nesting time. And what she means by that is, again, before a baby arrives, there's a nesting instinct. So it's like she's, um, I don't know, she's saying, 
she's just excited. It's just like this energy of excitement with her. She's got that spring back in her step. Um, and she's thanking us for allowing her the space. Hi guys, the camera died. So um, I'm gonna leave it there for today. And thank you for watching. This will definitely be continued another time. Much love. Bye-bye.